also have Analia. Uh, we had a couple of sponsors. Um, some of them were anonymous, but we also had a sponsor from uh, uh, some uh, very important people in the synagogue to us. Marie Nechmad was a nice donor to us as well. We want to thank her, her for her contribution. All right, it's Purim. It's the year 5,783, and um, you've already heard two awesome speeches, so there's no way it's possible for me to share an idea without a theme that has not been touched on already. Okay, so um, I apologize if you hear anything that was uh, repeated already for this evening, but um, I, I definitely have something interesting to share with you. Um, I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, the Gemara tells in Tani that Mishanichnas Adar Marbim Misimcha that there's a special power of this month that when the month comes in, we're supposed to increase our joy. But if you were paying attention to the news, there is an organization called the GDL, right, the Goyish Defense League. And um, I'm not joking, by the way. Um, and it's run by a guy named, this is the Wikipedia page for it. Uh, if you want it, I'm happy to share with you afterwards. There's a guy named uh, John Mindeo, Minadeo II. I don't know who his father was, never heard of him. But uh, he's an American, this is, this is straight from Wikipedia. He's an American anti-Semitic uh, anti uh, anti anti conspiracy theorist and a white supremacist. He's the leader of, this is it, Goyim Defense League or the, the Goyish Defense League, as I call it, and is known for his videos on the platform of Goyim TV, banner drops, and his distribution of propaganda. Okay, um, you can look, read his story over here, it's fascinating. Um, the the uh, GDL is a play on the ADL. So this past Shabbat was, he declared it a Shabbat of hate. Right, it was, there was an increase of uh, security all around the synagogues in, in the New York area. Uh, actually, it wasn't only in the New York area, it was all the United States. Um, it, we take these things very seriously. Um, and if you were uh, watching your Instagrams or if people from uh, or South Orlando sent you some of the videos of these guys heckling Jews and so on and so forth. Um, there's a, uh, in the video he's holding a microphone, right, and he's, uh, he's uh, doing his Hitler salutes, he's shouting anti-Semitic language, people leaving Chabad, and he's saying, Heil Hitler, telling people go back to Israel, asking them, you know, sir, do you think that you, that, uh, that you should be put into, into an oven? You know, like very, very hurtful, very, very hurtful, hurtful things. Okay, the rabbi there, his name is Rabbi Yosef Kanikov, and he said that whatever this group was trying to accomplish, they actually had the opposite effect what they're trying to do. Right, this is a quote. He said, it's only, it only strengthens us. It strengthens the Jewish resolve and the Jewish people around the world to get more support from the Goyim. So if they're listening, thanks. That was his push. Um, now these things are, uh, are very painful. Um, and I, it's not an accident that these things emerge in the month of Adar. We don't believe in accidents because the whole month of Adar, like we're going to see hopefully soon, is all about recognizing that there is no such thing as accidents. There's no such thing as things that just are coincidence. We don't believe in that. Um, if you remember the story, Mordechai ends up approaching uh, Esther and comes to her and says, listen Esther, this is what's going to happen, you know, there's a decree that's being written, you, you, you know about it, Haman wants to destroy all the Jewish people, he wants to w obliterate them all in one day. This wasn't like the Nazis in Germany who conquered small areas and had to go from country to country and find the Jews, which is what their plan was. This was one kingdom, one superpower that had every single Jew in the world living in it, and this superpower had made an edict, a decree, that every single Jewish male, female, child has to be killed. One night. One day. This is Maaseh This happened 2,400 years ago. So now Mordechai recognizes something has to be done. He approaches his cousin or sister, however you want to understand the story, Esther, and he says to her, you got to do something. And if you don't, the Pasuk says, he says, If you do not get up, or if you remain silent during this time, relief and deliverance will come from someplace else. Right? He wasn't too worried about this uh, circumstance. He wasn't too concerned of Esther's ability to deliver or not. He was confident that there's going to be some type of a resolution to this situation. He didn't believe the decree would actually happen. He said, listen, Esther, you have a choice to make. You're either going to step up, and if you don't, someone else will step in. No, but I'm not worried about it. It's not going to come from you. 
It says over here, Rebbe Fatsala Yamola Yehudi Memakom Acher Ve'et Bet Avicha Ta'avedu And your, the name of your, the, the, the house of your family will be forgotten. Who knows, maybe the whole purpose of this position, of you being in the scenario that you find yourselves in right now, was part of the plan. But I'll prove to you that Mordechai was super confident, irrespective of Esther's decree. So what he happens is that she says, okay, you know what, I'll do this on one condition. You go back, you tell the people they got to fast for three days. Okay? So he, Mordechai comes back, Pasuk says, Vayavor Mordechai. Okay, Mordechai went about. Vayas kechol asher tzivita alav Esther. He did everything that Esther had commanded. Right? He didn't believe that he needed the fast. He didn't believe that any of this was necessary. He did it because she asked for it. Not because he wanted it. He did it because she commanded it. Not because he said it. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, uh, but we know that the story, so much of the story begins with Mordechai. Mordechai is heckling Haman, who's a very powerful person. He's going out of his way to, uh, to, you know, egg him on. Pasuk says, Every single person in the courtyard, when they saw Haman, they'd bow and prostrate themselves before him. But what happens? Right? He can't see Vilo HaMelech, because this is what the uh, king had commanded. There was a king who lived, Achashverosh. He said, you see Haman, you got to bow before the guy. But Mordechai, nah, he wasn't going to bend. He wasn't going to bend the knee. He was not taking one. He was not going to... Everyone else was ready to bend the knee, but Mordechai was not. And the question is, why not? You could argue, Pikuach Nefesh, you know, it's a Hatzalah you're going to go ahead and try to figure out a way of saving the people, do something. Why was he egging on the second most powerful man in Persia? So, and we see this, by the way, it goes on. It says, V'yar Haman, Haman sees, Ki ein Mordechai koreo b'shtachavelo. He sees this, V'yimale Haman chama, and he was filled with rage. It enraged him. He was mamash egging him on. He was but Mordechai, he wanted to figure out a way of, uh, you know, getting his hands on him, but he just couldn't figure out what he's going to do. He said, Mordechai, this guy was so enraged by what Mordechai, what Mordechai did to him that it wasn't enough to kill Mordechai, he had to kill every single Jew as a result of this show of disobedience by Mordechai, right? Why would, why would Mordechai do it? Why would he go out of his way to create a scenario that forces Esther now to go ahead and ask the king for salvation? What was he thinking? And I'm going to give you an answer that's very difficult to fully appreciate, but I think this is, this is an answer, not the answer. There's a pasuk in Tehillim that says, Ki lo yanuach shevet harasha al gorel the, 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 uh, the, uh, the scepter of the wicked Right, will never rest upon the allottedness of the the allotted the that the land is allotted to the righteous, right? Meaning, no matter what happens by a rasha, if you have a tzaddik gamor, nothing bad could happen to that tzaddik. Which means, I would argue that Mordechai was fully well aware of who he was. He was super confident in his righteousness. There was no doubts in his mind that if you lived in a town like Abraham asked Hashem, are there 50 tzaddikim in this place, can you save it, right? There were righteous people in living in Shushan. Not all the Jews were lost. Plenty of them were lost, because we know that Persians like the party, and started way back then, right? But he, Mordechai had something different. He had something called emuna and bitachon. A very deep level of emuna, of faith, and bitachon, trust. But what, what is that predicated on? The Rambam tells us in the Sefer HaMitzvot that the Pasuk, Anochi Hashem Lokecha, we, we recited a few weeks ago here in the Bet Knesset, Rapashat Yitro, where God comes out and he introduces himself and says, Ani, I, Anochi, I, Hashem Lokecha, I am Hashem, your God, Hashem, at the time we took you out of the land of Egypt, right? I saved you guys. So according to the Rambam, this is a, the first principle of emunah. Belief in God is belief in this pasuk. You have an obligation, according to Maimonides, to believe, to have emunah, that there is a God. But most people are unaware that there's a second commandment that is found in this pasuk. It says, Anochi Hashem, I am Hashem, who? Elokecha. 
What does that mean? Your God. What does that mean, he's your God? Right? He's not anyone else's God. There's a, a personal, deep relationship that he has with each of you. He loves you. Pasuk in Dvarim says, Banim atem Hashem You are my children. You are God's children. You're not just stam people that are living alive. You are the offspring of an infinite being's desire to give you the opportunity to be the best you. Pasuk says also, Kama Hashem banim bechori Yisrael. The Jewish people are considered to be my firstborns, my choicest ones. This is what Am Yisrael is. You are part of this group of people that have this deep relationship with Hashem. And therefore, the second part of this mitzvah, of Anochi Hashem Lokecha, this pasuk, it's not enough to know that God is one, but also He is your God. It's having emunah that God is God, that there's a God in the world that created the universe. And in addition to that, there's another idea of knowing that God is your God. It's not enough for you to know that God created the universe. Oh, I believe in God, but do you believe that He's your God? Do you believe that there's an infinite being that loves you deeply, that He thinks of you as being b'ni b'chari? Are you living in that reality? So you have emunah, the, the belief that there is a God, and then the bitachon, trusting that He is not only a God that exists, but He is the God that loves you as a second part of this mitzvah, the second part of these 248 positive commandments to um, believe in Hashem. So, we say, Baruch HaGever Asher Yiftach Hashem. right? Blessed is a person who trusts Hashem, right? Vaya Hashem Miftacho, right? Hashem will be his savior, his sanctuary. He'll be his, his place of, uh, his source of, uh, of protection. This is the idea of Mordechai. Mordechai lived in this reality. Now, I'm sharing this because I got a phone call actually on, uh, on Sunday from a student of mine, an old student from an, from an organization he used to work for called Rage. His name is Misha. And Misha gives me a call. And he says, Rabbi, you know, this whole thing with the GDL is really upsetting me. My wife is scared and people are scared out there. And you gotta, you gotta, you gotta give a class on Wednesday, on, 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 on Monday night. He's like, I know you're giving a class, I can't make it. He's like, I'm gonna watch it. But if, please do me a favor, I want you to share this message with the people. Let them know there's nothing to be afraid of. There's, not, there's no fear. There's no reason to be afraid. You know, we're not worried about the, uh, the uh, John Mendeo's uh, propaganda. We're not worried about the GDL's insanity. We don't care about them because we believe there's a higher power, a greater force that is working through every moment of history. That when you think of the challenges that you find yourselves in right now, they're not by accident. I was at a, in Great Nick last night at, with a, on a panel with this really amazing, brilliant woman who I'm married to. And um, <laughs> she, <laughs> she, she was, um, you know, uh, it took a while to get her to speak last night. We spoke about joy and happiness. And um, she said something yesterday that was so profound that I, it's definitely worth repeating. I wasn't planning on saying it, but it fits in so nicely. It just clicked. Thank you, Nalini. Um, and uh, she said that, that when the pasuk <clears throat> in the brachot in the morning, when we say, we thank God for giving us all the things that we have. She said that it includes all the things that we have and all the things that we have that are not so good. That we believe that everything that we have that is good and not so good, kol, everything, all the things that I need, the things that I'm lacking, and all the things that I need, all the things that I have. All of that is in that bracha, both sides. There's no one element of, oh, okay, you know, God gives me the good, it's blessing, and then when it's not there, everything is part of a greater package. The Jews of Shushan were terrified that in one swoop of a day, every single Jew would be annihilated. This is 70 years after the destruction of the first temple. So they were already deflated, already broken, already bent, uncertain about their trust and belief in God. But Mordechai is operating on a, using different, a different operating system. He's, he's thinking on a different level. He has super clarity. He has bitachon. He trusts. He knows that God would never allow his children to be completely obliterated. Do we go through hardships? Yes. Do we go through challenge? Yes. And even when the challenge is there, my friends, it's for your good. 
Okay, this story that I'm going to share with you right now, this is a Yol, hashtag Yol Gold story. It's not, he hasn't known about it yet, but he'll hear it hopefully tonight, then it'll turn into like one of those fancy videos. Okay, so this was, this. I had a couple uh, who came to my house for Shabbat. We like to host, and when you guys are ready to come, you let me know when you're coming for Shabbat. Um, and um, she was an old student of ours from uh, Teret Nava, and she, was, she got married about, uh, about a, almost two years ago now. Um, and they were coming for a Shabbat. This is going to be their first Shabbat, uh, the second Shabbat coming to us as a married couple. They're only married for three months at this point. And, um, uh, you know, it's Arab Shabbat, and it's getting closer. Shabbat came in at 4.18. This is around Hanukkah time, one of the earliest Shabbats of the year. And they're coming from Muncie. They live in Muncie. And they're driving and driving and driving. And uh, they're telling me how they're in the GPS. And they say they have four hours to get to my house. And every minute they're in the car, the GPS starts recalibrating, and they're losing more and more minutes. And it's getting closer and closer to Shabbat. And I'm telling my wife, well, where are they? I'm, I'm getting nervous. Like, where is this couple? Where, 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 what's going on? We don't know where they are. All we know is that they're not, they're not making it for Shabbat. So after Shabbat, we hear this following story. And then, then this, this, the second half of the story, I was told this past Shabbat, when they actually made it to our house for Shabbat, and they were there on time. So as the clock was ticking, they realized they're not making it to our house. And you're coming in from Muncie, and you're going through the Van Wyck. You're near Queens. They realize they're just going to pull over somewhere. And they'll find some Jewish community. And they pull over and they're in some place called Jamaica, Queens, which is not a, not a very good neighborhood if you know Jamaica, Queens. Okay? Um, you know, the way he said, he's like, I literally, he's like, I saw, like, you know, hyperdermic needles on the floor. And like, it was, it was like, a, it was a very scary place. He's like, we pulled over, it was some shady place, but it was across the street from, uh, from the Jamaica hospital, just to be exactly where it is. And they're going to park their car there, but now they, they weren't sure where they were. What are they going to do? They have all their clothes for Shabbat. They have no idea where they're going to go. They're going to, take, they're going to wear all their clothing with them because they don't know about the A-Roof situation. And they're going to go to the hospital and try to get the security guy to, to, to kind of like call an Uber for them because they didn't have Uber on their phones. So they go there and they're like, listen, you know, we're Jewish. They're wearing, all their, they're wearing layers of clothing. They're all their Shabbat clothing because they don't know what's going to happen, right? And uh, which was kind of smart. They put all their electronics in the trunk of their car and he hid his key, by the way, which I thought was ingenious, in his gas tank, in the, in the flap of the gas tank. This way he could come back to the car and open it up and get the key out of there. I would have thought to put it on the left, top of the left tire, but I guess all the criminals know that if they want to take your car, that's the first place they'll look. So uh, they, uh, they, uh, they put the key away, they go to the security guard, and you have this, this guy, that he's, he looks Hasidish. Okay, beard, peyot, blue eyes, reddish beard. She's also like Ashkenazi, pale, white, blue eyes, wearing her, you know, her mitpachat. And they're coming to this guy, they look like, you know, Quakers. And uh, they're asking, you know, uh, to, you know, please, you know, which it's our Sabbath. You know, we don't, you know, we can't make a phone call. Could you mind calling a cab for us and whatever it is. And he's, he says, okay, he's like, you, you want me to call you a cab? He's like, yeah, just call us a cab. They memorize my address. They give me the information. And they're waiting outside. 10 minutes pass, 25 minutes pass, 40 minutes pass, nothing comes. They come back inside. He's like, oh, they didn't come. I'll call you another one. Five minutes, ten minutes, he's, then, he's like, I don't know where all the cabs are. He's like, they must be stuck on the Van Wyck. They can't get through traffic. It's so bad. Nothing's coming through. So at this point, they realize that it, Shabbat is getting, it's getting later and later. And if they don't go out and try to find the Bet Knesset or a place, they're going to be stuck in, standing in the, in, the, in the lobby of a hotel without anything for Shabbat. So he remembered that he had a chavruta that lived in Queens, in a place called Kew Gardens, not too far. And he was going to walk, and they find the map right outside of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, hospital. There was a subway there with a map, and they saw Kew Garden, looked perfect. My friend said he prays in a place called Beit Gabriel, he remembers it, and he's going to walk there. It's like a 45 minute walk, the guy had no idea where he was going, okay? So they're going to, they have a whole plan about how they're going to find people along the way. If they see a Jew, they'll stop and ask. They just don't know what to do. What do you do when you're stuck in a Shabbat, right? So, uh, uh, they're walking and walking and walking, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. This is a newlywed couple. He's trying to reassure his wife this is part of his plan. It's all going to be good. Don't worry about it. What do you say to a girl? She's going, where are we, we going to stay tonight? They're walking through a horrible neighborhood with drug addicts and whatnot. And um, they're walking and, you know, they're, they're looking for something Jewish. To, you know, like someone Jewish, someone to, who's wearing a Shabbat suit, maybe a hat, something that is identifiable. And they, they realize as they're walking through this neighborhood, that, you know, it's probably a more modern neighborhood and it's very possible that, like, they pass by. He's, he's trying to eye everyone, like, straight, like, try to, like, get, like, 
try to get like some Shabbat eye contact to see if like they'll like respond to him and say something, but he doesn't know what to do because he doesn't recognize anyone as being Jewish. And after he's walking and walking, he finally bumps into this one guy. It does not look like he's Jewish, but he's cold out. You know, he's wearing a hood and whatever, like a fancy jacket, and he's got a hoodie on and whatever it is. So um, he says, he says, Shabbat Shalom. He's like, oh, Shabbat Shalom to you too. He's like, one second. He's like, before you go, he's like, you know, like we're kind of like stuck. I just need some help. So I don't know about you, but if I was walking through the streets <laughs> and some, some guy, you know, you know, with his wife appeared with these crazy amounts of clothing on, you know, asking me for like help that they're stuck, something like that, I'd probably walk away. No, I wouldn't walk away, but I'd probably want to hear. So the guy stops, says, listen, you know, like, you know, tells him the whole story. We were trying to go to these people in Long Island and we ended up getting stuck in the Van Wick and, you know, we need help. Help, we're really stuck. We need a place to go for Shabbat. So he's like, you know what? He's like, I know a family in my neighborhood. They always like hosting. He's like, I'm gonna, let's go there. I'll try to get you into a family. I know the perfect family for you. So like, amazing. So he's like, listen, you know, he's the, the guy telling the story. His name is Matis Yahu. So he says, you know, um, I, I got to create some kind of like Jewish geography with this guy and figure out you know, uh, if we know anyone, because he's going to bring me to some stranger's house. He'll say, how do you know him? He's going like, I just met these people on the street. There's no way this family's going to take us in. So they start playing Jewish geography. You know, where are you from? This and that. He's like, oh, you know, I'm from Muncie, and I learned in this place called um, Torah David in Muncie. So he's like, oh, really? He's like, you know, he's like, um, I know someone from Torah David. His name is Yosef Cohen. He's like, Yosef Cohen? He's like, Yosef Cohen is my chavruta who left Torah David three months ago and moved to uh, some, some yeshiva in Queens. He's like, no way. He's like, that's my chavruta now. The guy that he was learning with, Matatya was learning with, who left his, cult, his, his program three months ago, now is learning with this, this guy that picked him up in the street. So now they play the Jewish geography game. They just trust. And there's a tremendous amount of ability of bringing this guy into this, this person's family, this, this family in Queens. So they get to the family. And uh, they tell him the whole story, like, oh, for sure, come in. They wanted him to feel comfortable. You know, they, they uh, made him a kiddush and so on and so forth. They had an amazing meal. The family's the, the, uh, the, uh, the Voodi family in Queens. I don't know who these people are, but you know who they are? OK, great. So they are, they're known for their hospitality. And uh, they take a lot of people in. And the irony is that, that the reason why that, uh, that, you know, there's generally a list, a waiting list for, to get into this house. They always have guests. But they were doing construction on their house. And they didn't think the construction would be ready before Shabbat. But it happened to be the contracts are finished. This never happens. <coughs> but it happened to be that he finished, finished on Thursday. So they didn't have time to have guests. So they had a bedroom that was open, available, just for these people. So they spent Shabbat with these people, OK, which is beautiful. Where else are you going to find you know, a group of people that are willing to take another group of strangers, this cra crazy story, and, you know, and have them for a whole Shabbat? They're super comfortable. It's a Sephardic family. And this girl, uh, her name is uh, Malka, who's been to our house a lot. Her comfort food is Sephardic food. And this family was serving similar foods. So she felt like very much at home. And all of her nerves were calmed by just being in this family, finally figuring out where she belonged for Shabbat. And the next day, they go to shul. And the rabbi of the shul comes up to him and says, you know, who are you? What are you doing here? And he tells them the story. He's like, oh, he's like, this is, a, this is a Hanukkah miracle. It's a miracle that you know, this whole entire thing happened. And this family took you in. And the best part about it is your name is Matadyahu. That's the story of Hanukkah. So you you see even a greater connection and so on and so forth, right? Anyway, so um, the, uh, the, uh, the Voodi family says to the Matadiyah, listen, you know, they came back for lunch. He's like, you know, where'd you park your car? You parked it all the way there. He's like, your car's for sure going to get towed. Why don't we go to the store owner there and tell him that if the cops come, let's tell him the scenario and, you know, don't worry about the car. We'll come back. We'll pick it up. We'll move it away. So they start walking. It's like a 25 minute. Look at this guy. such a nice guy. He walks with them for almost 30, 40 minutes to the car. Okay, they get to the car. And the car is in this, the parking lot of this, uh, I guess, shopping area. And there are these two massive SUVs parked on each side of the car. You can't even see his car. It's blocked. So they didn't even bother going and saying anything to the, to the uh, what's it called, to the store owner. They walk back. They had their Shabbat. The Shabbat's about to an end. And uh, the uh, Rabbanit, the, the Rebson Davudi, says to them, listen, you know, you're such, an, you're such an inspirational couple. Can you give us a bracha? Give us a bracha. I'm, a, I'm in real estate. I've been trying to sell this house we have in the neighborhood for like a couple of years. I can't sell it. There's spiders in there. I don't know, something's bad luck in there. You know, I need you to go ahead and give me a bracha. So he says to her, in the same way that you open our house, your, your doors you know, to your home, may Hashem open up the doors for the parnasah that you could sell this house. Okay, they leave, they come to us to tell us what happened, Mosei Shabbat, and we're hearing this like, crazy story. And then weeks pass by, they became so close to the Davuti family that weeks go by and they have a, uh, they have a Lachaim, they're having a, they had, a, they had a, one of their kids got engaged, they came in for the engagement. 
And she, the, uh, the, the rabbits in the rabbinit that really told him, says, I want you to know, she's like, I sold that house within a, a week of your baracha. Seven days later, the house was gone, off the market. I couldn't sell it for, for two and a half years, and now it's just gone. Now, what I think is so powerful about the story, the way it concludes, is that exactly 12 months later, to the date, right, Malka goes into labor and gives birth to a baby boy. The same day that the Shabbat, they were lost in Queens, right? The same day that they went out of their way and they had this powerful experience where it was a tremendous amount of chaos and darkness, and then ended up somehow being this miraculous, amazing, inspirational story for, the, for themselves and their community and for us, hopefully, tonight. They had a baby boy and they named him Zachariah after Rabbi Wallerstein because they were very close to Rabbi Wallerstein. And, um, you know, the story is very much a story that Rabbi Wallerstein would have told had he been, had he been here today with us. And, I, you know, the, the other interesting thing that I think is a powerful part of the story, but we, we, we said earlier that uh, this class is uh, dedicated for the Leila uh, Nishmat Neria ben Avraham, right? Neria was the name of the boy that met them in the street and said Shabbat Shalom to them and brought them to the Davuti family. And he passed away two and a half months later in a tragic swimming accident in Arizona. Right, there was a boy, a Jewish boy from Queens, I don't know if you remember the story. That, that was this boy. This boy was known to go out of his way to say Shabbat Shalom to every single person that he met. Right, and here's a person who went out of his way to do the right thing, and he ended up helping a couple that would have <laughs> gone through a lot of Shalom Bayan issues, right, had they not f figured everything out for themselves. But how powerful is that? Here you are, you think you're lost, right? You have no idea how you're going to, you know, uh, come out of the situation, how you're going to build yourself up, and you walk away with something that's so dark, so uncertain, so unclear, right? And it all worked out. Because they had, he and they had bitachon. They trust. I'm not worried about the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Goyish Defense League. I'm not worried about these people shouting crazy anti-Semitic things. Let them do it. Everyone tried and they failed. The story of Purim is a story of people that had this tremendous amount of focus, of belief that no matter what happens, Hashem is with us. Don't allow fear to get in the way. There's a mitzvah to be besimcha. There's a mitzvah for us to, to add simcha every single day of this month. Well, how are you doing it right now? Are you making extra l'chaims? How are you adding simcha into your world right now? So Rabbi Hajjav spoke about you know, getting rid of doubt. And simcha ka tarat There's no greater happiness than the resolution of doubt. But I think there's another way of doing it. The other way of doing it is by recognizing that Hashem is in love with you, that you are His children, Mani Bechori. You are His choicest children. He cares about you. If you, my friends, are sitting in the room tonight, you're part of a small group of Jews who are super dedicated to their faith, who had every ability to walk away from their heritage and somehow held on to something. You represent the group of people that trusted in Hashem. You're here, you showed up, you made it. I know that it gets difficult. I know about hardships. I know it's hard. There's so many uncertainties, so many things that are so challenging in the world right now. There's so much suffix, so much lack of clarity. But the way in which we're able to push through all of that is by sometimes just being, do, pulling a Mordechai, trusting 100% that it will always work out in the end. And when you're going through that hardship and you're not sure, it's like watching a movie and pausing and saying, oh, this is stupid, I can't watch it anymore. You have no idea what's going to happen at the end. Why are you giving in to the fear? Why are you giving in to the uncertainty? Jews never give up hope. Right? You never allow anyone to intimidate you. We don't allow the insane people of the world get into our heads. If they're getting into your head, it's because you are lacking bitachon. You don't believe in Anochi Hashem Elokecha. He is your God. He is in love with you. He cares about you. He wants everything in the world to be perfect. He wants it to be amazing. And I know it's hard to say that everything is amazing. But in the same way we say, Shasali Kotsarki, 
all of the needs. I'm telling you that everything we go through in the most challenging of times somehow always ends up expressing something positive. And it's just about us waiting to express it. The story of Purim ends, and this is for Misha. He asked me to share this as well. He says that, that there is a, um, um, we know how the story, we know that the story ends with Right, at the end of the story, the whole story, the whole story was changed. We said, Right, that all the, uh, all the happy, the opposite happened to the Jewish people, right? Their enemies, you know, uh, the Jews got the enemy's power. They were in a position of strength, right? And every single province and every single city where the kings commanded this decree, everything was, was everyone was their their attitude was switched from a place of, of, of sadness to a place of simcha and sason, right? It was a yom tov, right? If that says over here, varabi ma'ame ha'aretz mit yahatim, right? And there are plenty of people that professed, you know, to be Jewish. Ki nafal pachad hayudim alehem, for the fear of the Jews had fallen upon them. What does that mean over there? So you think that the whole uh, reason why you're coming to our Purim party next Monday night at the LC rooftop is just because you want to see circus performers, right? And you want a really good meal. But the reason why we get dressed up on Purim is because the Goyim were so afraid of Am Yisrael in the Purim story that they started getting dressed up as Jews. They were putting on the costumes and pretending to be Jews because they were so afraid of how fast that power switched the people that were ready to lynch and mob and kill every single one of our people, the next day turned into, they, got, they went to the store, and they went to uh, Hocus Pocus, and they got themselves some Jewish costumes and started wearing Jewish costumes. So when we are wearing our costumes on Purim, it's also to remind us that God is hiding behind the veil, that he's waiting to pull the curtain back so you can see, take a peek into the whole entire system. But it's also a reminder that everything around us can switch instantaneously. The people that are, 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 are saluting the Heil Hitlers are going to be the ones that are going to switch around tomorrow right, and wear the Hasidic garb because they're so afraid of being obliterated by the world that God has created for us. I know it's harsh. I know it's not, not, not simple. But the avodah of this month is learning to let go and trusting. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where the world's going to end up. We said, Gemara, I'm going to end with this. The Gemara in um, Sanhedrin says that the students of Rabbi Eliezer asked him, Rabbi, Rabbi, what can we do to protect ourselves from the, uh, the uh, footsteps of Mashiach? And he says, Ashri Aish Asher Yeyesham, Ashri Aish Asher Lo Yeyesham. Praiseworthy are those people that are going to be there, and praiseworthy are those that are not going to be there. But the two things you can do during this time of the year to protect yourselves from the craziness of the world is one, Kamilut Chasidim. Get involved in giving back. Do something. Stop, only, stop thinking about yourselves for a minute and start thinking about how you can make the world around you a better place. Open yourself up to giving to other people. Look other people that are in need. This guy, had he not looked at this person, his, his chavruta, right? This guy, Yosef Cohen, who's his chavruta. Neria ben Abraham, who meets this guy on Shabbat, goes out of his way to say Shabbat Shalom, this whole story tonight, from one person just doing a little act of chesed. If you can't do the chesed, the, then, then, then a higher level, that's too hard for you, you're too antisocial, do some limut Torah. Learn. Build yourself up. Find the information, the knowledge that you need to become a bigger, greater human being. But don't settle. Staying static is tantamount to death. All right. I want to wish you all... I want to, okay, fine. Okay, so I was just told that I have a few more minutes, so I'm going to keep going. I wasn't sure that... Oh, what's that? You want to have a conversation? Okay, I'll take questions in a minute. Um, one last idea. We know that uh, the uh, Gemara tells us that the generation of uh, uh, before Mashiach is called has something called Pneha Kelev, as the face of the dog, right? So, it, it, the face of the dog means like this: when a when you take a stick to hit a dog, what does this, what does the dog do? The dog starts barking at the stick. Right? It doesn't recognize that the source of its pain is coming from the person holding the stick. What does that mean? It means that the, ge the, the generation before Mashiach is a generation that is unable to recognize that the hardships that they are going through are an expression of God's ratzon and ignore the stick. 
The stick's going to be there. But remember, have bitachon, like Mordechai did, trust in the process, and you too will live in a mishinichnas adar mar b'simcha, when we have a, a year filled of smachot, of brachot, of yeshuot. Those people that need it, the refuah should have it. Those neshamot that need it, aliyah, they should have it as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Firm samach.